Hello, Driver Education. This is Ms. Roth. Today, we're going to be talking about Chapter 6, The Effects of Driver Condition. You're probably asking yourself, what exactly is driver condition? And the first thing we talk about is emotions and driving. And throughout this presentation, I want you to think about how do your emotions, your physical senses, and your physical capabilities affect your ability to drive? Do you have that in your mind? Because what we don't quite realize, an emotion is a strong feeling. It affects your decision-making skills, your ability to assess the risk in driving situations. And super strong emotions can also block your ability to judge and reason accurately. Um, I talk often about how maybe my mother, um, if you ever really want to see pure horror, you know, drive with her when she's mad at you because all of a sudden she becomes this horrid driver who's out to get you. And if you're driving in that car with her, you basically would prefer to be walking. Okay. Think about when you had a heated conversation with your best friend. Think about, you know, anything going on. Okay. As teenagers, our worlds change all the time. Our hormones make our emotions change all the time. And we need to push a lot of that to the side in order to be a safe and responsible driver. Okay. We reduce these effects on our emotions by managing our risk, becoming a courteous driver. Okay. Not just being angry with the world. Okay. Strong emotions interfere with your ability to think, to reason, to make wise decisions and respond appropriately to situations, okay? Um, when we first start driving, we know that it's mainly a physical task, but then we get into it and we realize we have to put our physical task to the side and use our brain, okay? Emotions can really increase your chances of making a mistake. They can affect the way you make judgments and decisions in a driving situation. And it may cause you to focus only on one event, causing you to miss other things and, you know, miss something that's just coming out. Or as you see in this picture, you know, someone's kind of cutting you off. Um, they may have communicated with you, but, but we don't know. Okay. The more tasks you're given, um, the harder and more stressful it's going to be. And yes, stress can obviously um, determine how you're going to drive as well. Okay. Anger. And I already kind of mentioned with maybe my mom, anger occurs and is displayed more often than any other emotion. Okay. It's one of the hardest emotions to control. I want you to think about that last time that you were fighting with a friend and what's happening. Your body is reacting and all you're thinking about, you're going through that conversation. You're going through that fight in your head. Okay. Your body, your mind, it wants to, you know, fight or flight. You talked about that in health class with stress response. Okay. But anger really puts that urge to fight that blocks your ability to think rationally. It can impair all of your driving skills, all of them, okay? And it could cause aggressive driving or road, weight, or road rage, okay? Now, this is the first, this is a big thing that you need to um, distinguish between. You have aggressive driving, which is driving with our, without regard for other safety. So when I talked about my mom who was mad at you, you know, or mad at me, you know, she's just driving without regard to other safety, where then you have the road ragers who are out to get you. 
they have the intent to harm others. Okay, so aggressive driving, driving without regard for other safety, and the road rager is driving with the intent to harm others. They're not out for good. They're the people that are going to come out with a baseball bat or something way worse. Okay. And then we, of course, have other emotions um, that we really have to think about. We have sorrow. We have depression. We have anxiety. And remember, you know, Sadness, sorrow, and depression, they're very different, okay? Yes, one is I'm sad right now, and one is a mental condition um, that can make you really sad for a really long time. Um, it's also a chemical imbalance, as is anxiety a lot of the time. But these things can reduce your mental alertness, okay? Um, And anxiety is going to differ from anger, okay? You might have anxiety about driving in an unfamiliar, difficult situation. You may have anxiety about driving in general, okay? You might have trouble identifying hazards or risks when you're anxious, okay? And that's why we start driver ed the way that we do, because a lot of you are anxious about getting behind the wheel of a car. We know that it's more of a physical task. I have a lot of students, they set up their mirrors and I know full and well, they're really not gonna look at those mirrors, okay? They're not gonna be identifying the hazards um, or risks, okay? As a responsible driver, we work to recognize situations that might cause this anxiety. It may mean delaying your driving, um, putting your driving risks, you know, knowing that they'll be reduced um, just by putting that delay, okay? And then we come to emotions and the IPDE process, okay? Obviously, we talk about the identify, predict, decide, and execute often, um, but the successful use of it needs total concentration on that driving task. And remember that most of our driving task, again, is a thinking task, okay? High stress, you need even more time to use that IPDE, okay? Remember, peer pressure, strong force, okay? In a vehicle, you have to remember you're the driver, you're the leader, and take control. You are responsible for the safety of your passengers, Okay, if you've taken on that responsibility, then it, it's up to you to say to your friends, stop monkeying around, make sure you put your seatbelt on, stop playing with your phone and my radio and doing things that are going to influence the way that I'm driving. Okay. Spirits run high. Okay. Passengers can help the driver maintain control while driving, they can talk about positive events, discourage the driver from taking reckless actions, and maybe, I don't know, complimenting the driver for de doing a good job of driving in a difficult situation. Realize if you're in any sport that's governed by, say, the IHSA, so a sport, a theater event, you know, there are reasons why you have to take the school bus um, or the school vehicle to these events. That reason, they want you to get excited. They want you to get hyped up for the event. They don't want you to have to think about the driving task because they know that your emotions are running wild at that point. Okay. They have a big influence on the amount of risk you're willing to take. This is why we're looking at you as young adults. We're expecting you to be mature and responsible drivers to not let your emotions cause you to take these risks, okay? They might affect you differently and they might affect you how you're driving and on the same roadway at different times, okay? You might be concerned about something. You might be overly emotional about something. One of the harder parts of my job in car sometimes is looking at someone 
and, you know, asking them what's going on and they tell me they're having a bad day and I have to tell them, you know, I have bad days all the time, but I can't bring that into the car. I need to be able to push that aside so I can be a safe driver, okay? We need to learn how to control our emotions and have some emotional discipline, okay? So, you know, going back to like the aggressive driving, we want to remember to just continue to think positively. You know, if you have a road rager around you or someone who's super aggressive, to think positively, okay? To let others deal with the situation and just modeling good behavior. And that's all part of that emotional discipline, okay? More on emotional discipline um, in these high risk situations is you can use that IPDE process to drive in an organized manner, okay? Anticipate emotion producing situations and adjust your expectations. You know, if you're going to something sad, maybe you want to have someone drive you there or someone who is in better control of your of their emotions. Uber it. I don't know. If you encounter an aggressive driver, don't challenge the driver. Avoid eye contact. Think about when you're super mad at people and then they want to stare you down. It's not a good day. Okay. Adjust your route to avoid irritating traffic situations. When I used to drive, you know, 100 miles, you know, 50 miles to work and 50 miles back from work, I would take one route to school using the regular highway. And on the way home, I would take the tollway because I knew it was less of an aggravating thing. Okay. Make a special effort to control your emotions if you're tired, okay? Keep courtesy as one of your personal rules on the road, okay? Don't be that angry person. Don't be that super aggressive driver. And then we get into 6.2. 6.2 is talking about those physical senses and driving. So we're, first we just talked about those mental and emotional things. And now we're going to move on to um, we're going to move on to our physical senses. So we know that our physical senses would be seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. Okay, your senses help you to stay alert of changing situations. They give you a better chance of maintaining control of your vehicle and minimizing your risks. We've talked about for a long time that 90% or more of the information you get while driving is received through your eyes, okay? Your eyeballs are going to tell your car where to go. Your eyeballs are going to identify all the hazards and help you to process what's happened. You need to be able to see clearly and quickly identify closing zones in your intended path of travel, so where you're going, okay? Your brain directs your eyes to focus on objects in and around your path of travel. Information is sent to your brain. It's combined with stored information to allow you to identify those hazards, predict the conflicts, decide to maintain or adjust your speed and position, and then we know just do it, execute your decisions. In other chapters, we talked about that the ability to see clearly near and far is called your visual acuity, okay? You need to be able to see far, you need to be able to see near. Um, we know that an eye doctor or a person with quote unquote normal visual acuity is called 2020 vision. Okay. In order to pass the eye test, though, they have to see with 2040 visual acuity. Okay. Realize that 2040, it 
takes them twice as long and they need to be twice as close to an object to see it as clearly as someone with 2020 vision. Okay, so 2040 is what we need to test you for um, and what the DMV is going to test you for, but the reality is you probably should get your eyes checked out. You are driving a car now, okay? 2020 is where an eye doctor, that's the goal of an eye doctor to get you to see 2020 with correction, not to 2040, okay? I'm gonna try this out. So when I talk about different things, I always want people to visualize. So we talk about our field of vision. Well, this whole area, I know you can't see as well, but this whole area is going to be our field of vision, okay? Looking straight ahead, most people see about 90 degrees, so about 180 degrees. But there are different kinds or different parts of your field of vision, okay? different parts of your field of vision. So while I'm looking straight ahead and basically like right here, that's gonna be my, my central vision. So about 10 degrees. And then from 10 degrees on, okay, is going to be our peripheral vision. It's sensitive to light, it's sensitive to motion. And just like we've said with our blind spots, you're gonna start to almost feel people in your blind spots. And that's coming from your peripheral vision, okay? We also talk about the part kind of in between here called fringe vision. And it's close to your central and it's right before you get to your peripheral, okay? Side vision is used to monitor a zone condition after it has been clearly identified in central vision. So again, we've got field of vision, central, fringe, right outside, and then we have our peripheral vision. Good, okay. Um, the upper parts of your fringe there can detect changes in a rear view mirror. The lower part is to monitor reference points for vehicle positions. A narrow field of vision, 140 degrees or less, is called tunnel vision, okay? People who have tunnel vision need to compensate with just by moving their head. It used to be an addition of a side mirror, but um, now all cars have side mirrors on both sides, so you're all good. Um, but they can compensate. There are people who see way less than 140 degrees, and they may or may not be able to drive a car, okay? Good vision and driving includes our ability to look at colors and depth. Knowing our limitations while driving at night in glare or at a highway speed is going to be helpful. Um, I am a glasses wearer. I can see pretty much nothing without my corrections. And at night, as I've gotten older especially, my night vision is not good. Glare coming from other cars uh, reduces my vision a little bit more. It impairs my depth perception. But these are things that I know about myself. And I, I, I don't drive on the highway at night or I don't drive in a, in a not lit area. Um, it just helps me out and it reduces my anxiety and stress towards the driving. An inability to distinguish colors is called color blindness, okay? Red, green, and yellow are obviously big colors that we use, okay? Um, the most common type of color blindness is red and green. And people who are red and green color blind, and usually this is a male, um, a male inherited trait, but usually people who are colorblind doesn't mean they don't see the colors. They just see the colors differently than you and I who are not colorblind. 
would see them. So they'll compensate, they'll remember the order of the light. So remembering that it's red, yellow, green, or if they go down south where they flip them on their side, it's going to be red like a book. So it's going to be left to right, red, yellow, green, okay? They need to know the shapes. And this is why we ask you about the shapes and about what you're seeing, okay? Um, just being aware, hyper vigilant about using your IPDE, okay? That perception is that ability to judge distance between yourself and other objects, okay? We need to figure out how far that car is, judging a gap, you know, following that three seconds. How do I know how far three seconds is? Just being aware where the line is, where the ball is where anything is, is going to be your depth perception. And I kind of mentioned I have some issues seeing at night, um, which is that inability to see. Um, my doctor says I should be fine and it should work out, but it still is something that concerns me a lot. Um, <clears throat> especially just in dark places that don't have a lot of light for me to readjust. Um, and, you know, as you get older, friends, these are things that, that start to go away, okay? At night, you might have difficulty reading signs, roadway markings. I mean, look at the differences in the picture. You know, I used to be able to see the people really clearly, and now I see kind of a blur. I see kind of a, a smudge going on over there. Um, I could see, you know, the clock. I could see everything, and I knew what the cars were doing just a little bit better in the daytime. Glare occurs in the daytime when bright sunlight is reflected off shiny surfaces and the term glare resistance describes the ability to continue seeing when looking at bright lights, okay? At night, and this is what I've talked about, glare from headlights can be as dangerous as glare from sunlight, okay? Night glare caused by headlights, bright lights, high beam headlights, all of those things are going to affect your glare resistance, okay? And that's what I just said there. And then we think about glare recovery at time, okay? This is actually what slows down as you get a little older and that's why I have the night problems. But glare recovery time describes the time your eyes need to regain clear vision after being affected by glare. Think about when you were in a classroom and you've been watching a movie the whole time and your teacher at the end of class slams on those lights and the whole class goes, Ugh, right? Because your eyes need about five to 10 seconds to readjust. Um, or think about when you go to bed and you turn all the lights off in your room and it's pitch black, but then you wake up or you hang out for a little bit um, and you look around and all of a sudden you can see clearly because your pupils just needed that time to, to readjust, okay? Try not to look at those bright lights. Use your side fringe vision rather than your central. So remember, that's still central, but it's right on the cusp, right on the fringe of your peripheral and your central, okay? Wear sunglasses, adjust your rear view mirror for night use, which a lot of them do automatically now, okay? At higher speeds, field of vision is going to be narrowed, okay? At 55, which is, you know, standard highway speed, your clear side vision area is less than half as wide as at 20 miles an hour, okay? The blur you're gonna see, that's your speed smear, okay? It makes it like tunnel vision, okay? Your central vision decreases, your peripheral vision decreases, objects to your side become blurred. Think about those car commercials that, you know, it looks really cool, them driving really flat, fast, but when you're actually doing it, it might not look quite as cool to you, okay? Then we have, obviously, hearing, okay? Hearing 
can alert yourself to something that you may not be able to see. Okay. I, when I hear um, emergency vehicles, I try to figure out where they're coming from. Okay. How do I need to move over? What do I need to do? You might start hearing, you know, something squeaking or crackling or, you know, something hanging down. These are things you need to listen for. Driving with closed windows, with stereo or headset, okay, makes you unaware of critical traffic sounds. And of course, we know talking on a cell phone, um, <coughs> excuse me, as chapter eight comes in, you know, is going to create that distraction, but it's also taking away your sense of hearing at that point. Smell, you can identify an overheated engine, overheated brakes. Um, it can be an early warning of the presence of deadly gas, okay? Um, your sense of motion gives you clues to the movement of your vehicle. So if you think about it, when you're driving in a car and you kind of know someone is slowing, you almost feel yourself kind of brace down so you can take that turn. You veer a little right or veer a little left, okay? And you kind of feel that. Okay, any of you have pets that you don't really secure in the car and we all laugh when we take a turn and you knew what was happening so you kind of braced down and your dog flew across the entire car. Okay, um, that's that sense of balance. Your car could be vibrating, you know, you could have a flat tire, you know, you might have to, you know, the road surface changed, mechanical problems. All of this is with your, your, um, excuse me, all of this is with your central or your sense of motion. Okay. And then the last section we're talking about is physical limitations. Okay. Um, it's a diagnosed physical or mental impairment that interferes with or prevents normal activity or achievement in a particular area. Okay. I have to emphasize diagnosed because diagnosed means a doctor has given it to you, has told you that you are, you know, incapacitated in some way, mentally or physically, um, and has this documented, okay? People learn to respond to different disabilities, okay? Fatigue, being tired is just as bad, if not worse than being drunk, okay? Mental or physical work, emotional stress or loss of sleep can cause fatigue. Being a teenager, I feel, causes fatigue sometimes, right? Okay, it lessens your ability to perform tasks, okay? It dulls your senses. If you're tired, you need more time to use the IPDE process. I want you, and I'm talking tired. So I want you to think about being in the classroom or looking at your computer and someone's talking. And even though it's interesting, you find yourself doing the head bob. So, you know, your eyes are closing, your head's starting to go down, and then you kind of pop up. Now imagine that while you're going 65 miles an hour down the highway. Not fun. Okay. It can also cause just minor, you know, not minor, but cause drowsiness. Drowsy driving is estimated to cause at least, at least 100,000 collisions each year. Okay. And this is where you get that head bob, that drowsiness. Okay. If you can't stop yawning, your eyes are closing, you're doing that head bob, you should not be driving and the only thing to help this is to rest okay you can take a walk around take a stretch be active listen to the radio talk to your passengers stop in a safe well lighted place if you feel you can't drive safely try to take a quick nap try to take a little 20 minute snooze okay your safety is more important than your timing Okay, and then we have temporary illnesses or injuries. Any illness, a cold can impair driving to some extent. 
Okay, when your brain is in a little bit of a fog, you can't concentrate on driving. Okay, you have a broken bone, a sprained ankle, something is hurting, it can impair your driving. And then those medicines can increase your chances of being in a collision. Okay, be aware of the side effects. So if you remember when we took the permit test, we asked the question, is there any drug that you, you know, take that can interfere with safe driving. And these are not really your day to day, but we're talking heavy narcotics that are going to make you sleepy, um, things that are going to dull your senses, even something as simple as a Benadryl. Okay, Benadryl knocks me out, Benadryl knocks a lot of people out. You can't just take Benadryl and start driving a car or a NyQuil, okay? A lot of medicines have side effects, and that's what I just said. So just read the label. Be aware of how you're personally affected by those medicines. And then I already said earlier with deadly gases, carbon monoxide is our big one. It's colorless, odorless, it's tasteless, it's deadly, deadly. Colorless, odorless, and deadly. It's present in all engine exhaust ga gases, okay? A lot of times you can detect it because the gas mixes with the other exhaust fumes that do have an odor. Um, even if you don't smell it, it might still be there, okay? Carbon monoxide can cause drowsiness, headaches, muscular weakness, mental dullness, nausea, okay? It will, you know, basically people who, want, who get carbon monoxide poisoning, they go to sleep and they don't wake up. Okay, because it's just a silent killer that way. And smoking is, while you're driving, super dangerous because it also raises your carbon monoxide levels and reduces the oxygen in your blood. Okay, and this goes with any form of smoking. Okay, um, so vaping and cigarettes and, and all of those things. Um, and it can affect your passengers. Finally, we talk a bit about permanent disabilities. So things like epilepsy, blindness, loss of a limb. These are called, are considered permanent disabilities, are conditions that cannot be cured or improved. And realize that the only people who cannot get a license are people who are legally blind, okay? I can't see without my contacts or my glasses, but I'm corrected to 2020. Um, people who are legally blind, again, doesn't mean they don't see anything, but they might be so limited, they can't be corrected to a point they'd be able to see, okay? Um, I said with the tunnel vision, there are people who see way less, and they are considered legally blind. But people who can, who are deaf, completely deaf or hard of hearing, they can drive a car. The only people that cannot are people who are considered legally blind. So they cannot see 2040 looking straight ahead, okay? Um, people, paraplegics, pretty much everybody else can drive. Cars can be modified in such cool ways now that allows people with permanent disabilities to drive, to maintain independence, and to help themselves. Okay. And then a chronic illness lasts for years. So heart disease could seriously impair a person's ability to drive. In some states, uh, type 1 diabetes or type 2, if they're out of control, you might not be able to get a driver's license without a doctor's note, okay? Some require regular medications, they cause side effects, um, but you will have to get medical proof that your illness is under control, that you're okay. Um, <clears throat> like you need to be seizure free for six months in order to obtain a driver's license and have it be valid, okay? Sometimes they have to test more frequently. You know, there's a, there's a lot of different things that go along with it. 
And remember, you know, as we age, our reflexes slow down, our vision is dulled, our concentration, everything becomes a little different. And a lot of people who are aging are on some sort of medication um, to keep them to keep them ticking. Um, it's been lovely to talk to you and to teach you about emotions and the impacts of driver condition. Have a wonderful day.